of a man and his steel Settings the place where the ore meets the mill Martin Myers, he worked hard every day He watched the mill take a man to early grave Bending those rails was all he'd ever known He had no family, the mill was his home Hey, my name is Ryan, and you're watching Creative Sound Lab, a weekly TV show with recording tips, pointers, hopefully a few things you've never heard before. Well, what I was just playing for you in this uh, fader right here was my own uh, five-minute reverb chamber. And I'm going to teach you today how you can create your own reverb chambers to create unique effects that are completely unique to you, and they're tactile effects, so that they represent who you are and essentially the building that you create and mix music in becomes a part of your mixes. This is a totally different mindset from just pulling up a plugin that has a particular sound and using it over and over again. With this technique, it takes about five minutes and it can add a ton of life into acoustic guitar tracks, keyboard recorded pianos that you had to use a DI box for, and of course, vocal. So I hope you join me in this episode for a five minute reverb chamber. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna walk you through now basically how to set this up. It takes about five minutes, but it's totally worth it for the kind of effects that you can get. You know, you can use this for lots of different things, so five minutes in the front end, really isn't all that much work when you get so much benefit out of just setting this up and capturing the effects that you need. Okay, so we're back behind the desk here, and this is just a view of the ins and outs that I have available in my particular system. Now, yours will look differently, uh, but for mine I have quarter inch outputs. These are line level output. It's, it's, uh, it's important to know what kind of outputs your system has. And it's also important to make note of what kind of input your monitors use as well. Mine happen to be a line level input uh, on an XLR. So uh, essentially I'm going from quarter inch to XLR. Now for the main monitoring system, you know, I actually go out of here into some sort of way to control the volume. So I don't typically directly plug in my monitors into these outputs because I want to have a way of controlling the volume. So for this, I want to be real careful about how hot the soloed vocal is coming out of a dedicated um, output. So I'm going to make note that uh, that output 17 is going to be my uh, soloed vocal track. And then in the DAW, I'm going to specify that it's external out uh, for uh, number 17. And from here, it's going to be quarter inch line level to XLR line level. And I can send this if I daisy chain XLR cables. I can put this anywhere in the building, uh, wherever I think sounds best for that type of vocal effect. So from here, I'm going to rob this monitor, and I'll leave the other one so I can tell what kind of sounds I'm getting. Okay, so I've just moved in my studio monitor here into the live room. It's on top of a short bar stool, and I've run my XLR cable into the room here, plugged it into my monitor. It's getting a feed directly out of my external sound card. I typically use some sort of mixer or volume knob, but this is coming straight out of the sound card. I've got to be careful when I pull up these volumes. I also have it plugged in. It's not, pl it's not turned on yet, but it is plugged in, so it's receiving power. Finally, the last thing I have to do is I have to set up my microphone to capture this cool, wonderful sound of our reverb chamber. So I have a room microphone set up for that. It happens to be a stereo mic, one of my favorite mics, the R88. It doesn't have to be. It can be a 414. It could be a pencil condenser. It's really forgiving. This, this is really forgiving on what you choose to, to, to use. But I do like a mic with good mid-range, so it doesn't have to have you know, super clear highs, you know, as long as it has good mid-range, that's the part of the signal 
of this experiment here that I'm looking to capture. So let's head back into the uh, control room and have a listen to what we're getting here. Okay, so we're back here in the control room. I have uh, everything set up. So it's just a matter of sending signals and recording the signals back in. Now let's go ahead and have a listen to what I just have as the vocal. And I'll show you kind of how I'm setting that up. So here's our vocal track. It's somewhere in the second or third verse. I, I really don't know which. If I were doing this for real, I would start at the very beginning and play it all the way through to the end, even when there's no singing. And I'll kind of tell you why. Is let's just listen to this vocal track and see how much, uh, how much is actually getting into the mic because it was a live performance, and kind of see how we're going to have to deal with that. There's a stream that runs by the mill on its side. It ain't very deep and it ain't very wide. But the bodies they pulled out, you might recognize. Okay, so you can really hear how there is actually some cool string sound. There's some drums poking through. Uh, but the biggest thing with this, dealing with reverbs and effects, is that string sound is going to be a part of the overall guitar, guitar tone. And so I want to make sure that I'm not just capturing the passages that the vocalist is singing, but I'm also capturing all the noise and things that are coming in. That way it's a collective uh, bonding between the two tracks, between the dry, between the wet track that I'm gonna record in just a moment with the reverb chamber. It's really important to, to realize this because I don't wanna have to dip in and dip out with all this animation and stuff, uh, it, you know, to, to, to have to work around it. So rather than automating, I'd rather just capture the track and let that noise, that actual attack of the guitar, become a part of the guitar sound. And it actually does work out pretty cool. Um, I knew this when I was tracking with it, so we have to just continue um, this kind of continuity between the vocalist and the guitar tone. It's kind of like a singer-songwriter where the vocal track is a part of that guitar tone. There's enough pick sound in there that I want to be careful to make sure to capture the entire track. For the purposes today, I'm just gonna record just a passage just to show you how this stuff works. So here is without any of the effects here. I'm actually gonna take off the uh, compression, the uh, de -esser here to smooth out the sibilants. I'm actually gonna leave on this EQ. I was having kind of a weird peak that I wanted to get rid of. So I'm gonna go ahead and filter that from my reverb chamber signal. So I'm going to leave it dry so that the chamber interacts with the dynamics of the vocal. And that's really part of the realism of this effect. Here's what it sounds like without any sort of compression. There's a stream that runs by the mill on its side. It ain't very deep and it ain't very wide. Okay, so it's jumping around quite a bit is uh, recorded with an RE20. So, I mean, great vocal mic, um, but I just want to let it go out as dry as possible so that it has the most lifelike quality. From here, I'm going to take it out of the master bus, and instead of sending it to the main mix that we have here, I'm going to first turn the volume down. Uh, it's just kind of a word of safety, okay? Uh, then I'm going to external out and send it to 17. If you remember earlier when I was hooking up the quarter inch jacks, I chose the number 17. I made a, a record of it so I don't forget, and now I'm sending the signal to it. Um, I also need to make sure that nothing else is going to that output. So I don't want uh, drums going in there. I don't want shaker or something else that I might have been using the reverb chamber, uh, you know, last session or something before. Uh, I want to make sure that only this item um, is going out that output. Then from here, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hit play. I'm going to very slowly raise the volume. Now I shouldn't be able to hear any of the vocal in my one remaining monitor yet. What I'm doing is I'm just kind of listening to the sound in the building. and 
making sure that I'm not just going to absolutely blast the signal through my monitor. I want to be very careful. It's, a, it's an expensive piece of equipment, so I want to be careful with it. So I'm just going to hit play and slowly raise the volume just enough for creating the reverb chamber. Bodies they pulled out, you might recognize. Okay, so you may not have been able to hear that because I, I shouldn't have any live microphones going on right now, but I was basically just listening to the sound uh, through the door, through, through the building, and just kind of comparing it to how I am familiar with sounds coming out of the live room into the control room. You know, does it sound like it's a blaring guitar amp? If it is, turn the volume down. I don't need to be pushing that much out of my studio monitor. Now from here, I'm going to collect the signal, so I'm adding gain to the preamp of that room mic that I have. There's a stream that runs by the mill on its side. It ain't very deep and it ain't very wide. But the bodies they pulled out, you might recognize. Martin says he don't know how he survived, no. Okay, so I'm just kind of creating a balance between the gain of my, uh, my microphone and the output that I'm feeding um, the studio monitor. Essentially, this track volume is the master volume of my studio monitor. Okay, so I'm creating a direct output from the track to that monitor and some kind of just feathering, and if, if I need to push up more gain on the preamps, I can kind of compensate by actually turning up the monitor. Then from here, all I do is create an input with the pair of inputs. This could be any input, whatever it is that these preamps are set to. And then it's just a matter of collecting, recording that signal. So I'm going to leave this soloed. Um, just because I don't need to hear the rest of the music. Um, I don't want to take a chance of any noise getting into the recording. So I'm just going to record uh, basically with monitors down or tracks solo. There's nothing here in the, in the control room, no sound or anything. And I'm just going to record in a quiet building the sound of that speaker playing the vocal in the room. There's a stream that runs by the mill on its side. It ain't very deep and it ain't very wide. But the bodies they pulled out, you might recognize. Martin says he don't know how he survived. No, no. He survived. Okay, so now we have our, our reverb chamber. We have it captured as a separate track. So now since we have dry, we have wet. Um, I've also went ahead and captured a sound of a plug-in. So we can also make a comparison of uh, the sound of a plug-in compared to a real reverb chamber. And from here, it's just a matter of uh, bringing the studio monitor back in, setting it back up, and continuing with the mixing process. If you have other things that you'd like to add the reverb chamber to, like acoustic guitar, if it's if it's lacking depth, uh, snare drum, uh, if it's lacking any sort of depth or anything, uh, this would be a great time to go ahead, record the entire track front to back with individual tracks, and then go ahead and collect everything that you need and after a couple hours of going through and collecting, um, you know, wonderful tactile reverbs, bring your monitor back in, and then you can have a stereo setup for mixing. Okay, so I just pulled in the second monitor uh, back here in the control room. So I got two monitors back on the the mixing desk here, and really I have the uh, recorded file right here on one of the faders. So it's a matter of the original vocal and the wet vocal, the the wet sound. So um, you know, there's no sound in the building anymore, and it's just a matter of blending the two however I like it. 
So let's check out and see what the results were um, of my reverb chamber. I was able to listen to it with the one monitor and kind of get a feel, but I wasn't able to quite get the scope of, of exactly how it sounds within a full, complete mix. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the reverb chamber now and just leave the dry vocal and see what we have. It's a stream that runs by the mill on its side. Yeah, so you can hear it. it's a really, um, a really smooth sounding effect. It it doesn't have, um, it doesn't really sound like an effect. It, it actually sounds like we had a mic set up uh, in the room when he tracked the vocal. It's pretty close. You know, we used a monitor that is about as accurate as you could get to something real. Uh, it's flat. It's accurate. It's dynamic. Uh, the mid range is accurate in it. Of course, uh, there's going to be limitations bec between the, a monitor and somebody actually in the room, but we're simulating, um, you know, sound waves being active in the room, and we're capturing them. So we're taking it out of the the electronic, the the electrical medium, and converting it using a transducer into sound waves, and then acoustic energy is bouncing around and we're recapturing it with another transducer, converting it back into electrical signals. So that process alone is going to be very unique to your recording space, to my recording space, above and beyond what a plugin could do. Let's have a listen to this once more, and then I'm gonna pull up the plugin. I bounce that down to a track as well. We just kind of compare and contrast uh, the two because they're both very useful sounds. The plugin just has a particular sound, and uh, for Flint's project, I really favored the the reverb chamber over the plugin. Here's the reverb chamber first. There's a stream that runs by the mill on its side. It ain't very deep and it ain't very wide, but the bodies they pulled out, you might recognize. Okay, I'm really pushing it there, and then I pulled it out just so you can kind of train your ears, you know, because it blends so nicely with that original vocal. It's, it's almost easy to forget that it's there. Then here's the um, the plugin that I bounced to its individual track here. You'll see it as the uh, Vox FX250. That is the EMT250 by uh, UAD. Let's see what that sounds like. There's a stream that runs by the mill on its side. It ain't very deep and it ain't very wide. But the bodies they pulled out, you might recognize. Martin says he don't know how he survived. No, no. So the MT250, um, it really has a nice sound to it. Um, this plugin I've used many times in a mix. It just has a, a reverb that can very nicely penetrate a mix. Um, it's a nice kind of upper mid-range sound to it. But it does have kind of a, uh, a mathematical sound to it. Uh, it's just kind of the pros and cons of a, a digital reverb, mind you, a plugin that's emulating a digital reverb. So I can't speak for if we had a real uh, EMT250 here. These things are pretty rare. Um, but it definitely has a sound to it. And if you don't have even the money to purchase a plugin, I mean, if you have more time than money, then, you know, the five minute reverb chamber is really pretty good. Uh, let's listen to that again. There's a stream that runs by the mill on its side. It ain't very deep and it ain't very wide But the bodies they pulled out, you might recognize So you can see, I mean, that, that to me is superior for this particular application. Um, you know, it's not always about uh, having 
tons of effects and outboard gear and plugins and things. It's just about being resourceful with uh, a little bit of know-how with one of your monitors, one of your mics, which you already have. It's just a matter of setting it up in a room that you think is a nice sound and capturing a sounds through that room. So this is this is really cool and a really cool comparison of plugins versus a real tactile effect. Now, a couple other things that I like to do uh, when using this for mixing is just like uh, the plugins, they typically have a built-in pre-delay feature. You can, you know, toy with that. I also like to add my own delay to my reverb chamber because it's just like pre-delay. This is a short verb, and this is actually already compressed at this point. Um, but I can add the pre-delay to uh, help kind of bring out even more of the sound of the reverb. There's a stream that runs by the mill on its side. It ain't very deep and it ain't very wide. So that's kind of getting into the texture of what the EMT 250 could do. Kind of that kind of upper mid high uh, range, um, kind of almost plasticky kind of sound. I, I can kind of bring it out when I can hear the attack of the delay come in um, because it's separated out from the syllabants of the dry vocal. I can hear more of that. Uh, this is 80 milliseconds. There's a stream that runs by the mill on its side. It ain't very deep and it ain't very wide. So, I mean, that sounds like a lot of delay in the mix. Uh, I don't know, it may kind of blend in. You may not hear that delay as much. Let's see. There's a stream that runs by the mill on its side. It ain't very deep and it ain't very wide. But the bodies they pulled out. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that I really like that. So I'm probably going to turn it back to, uh, I think I'll do maybe 20. The stream that runs by the mill on its side. Yeah, so 20 milliseconds kind of pushes it out from really kind of sticking itself to that dry vocal, but it also gives me a little bit more of a polished sound with separating it out. Um, so I think I'll go with that uh, for this. So just, you know, delay is something really cool that you can do. And just because it's, you know, locked in time doesn't mean that you can't shift it just like you do with the pre-delay on a vocal plugin. So a few really key applications that I typically will use the reverb chamber with is acoustic guitar, uh, vocal, any sort of keyboard piano that I'm handed if I'm just mixing. Uh, you know, particularly if I'm just the mixing guy, then I'm gonna go ahead, first thing I do is listen to everything, see what I like, see what I don't like. For anything that needs a three-dimensional quality, I'll set up the reverb chamber, go ahead and spend a day just tracking through all the songs they give me. Track the acoustic, just anything that needs a little bit more depth. I want to be able to have it for when I'm ready to mix. Uh, beyond uh, studio recordings, this is also great for live recordings because pretty much for a certainty it's going to be an acoustic guitar with a DI box. It's going to be a keyboard with uh, another DI, direct feed. Uh, so it's these types of things really need a good lift in a live recording and when they're trying to compete with the sound of a studio recording this trick is is really key for ma ma uh, augmenting uh, the level of what you can do with that live recording into the studio world the only thing it doesn't really work well on is snare drum it'll work fine if there's plenty of tonalities that you need out of the snare drum originally, but if the drummer may not have picked the uh, properly tuned drum at the time, or the snares uh, broke, or the snares weren't really captured very well, it essentially sounds like a cardboard box or more like a tom, then this, uh, this technique of the reverb chamber will really only amplify what you're given. So if your snare drum sounds like a tom or it sounds really dead, it's not going to be a magic fix for uh, adding more snare buzz to your snare. Now, next episode, I'm actually going to walk you through how to do this, how to actually uh, rebuild, not sampling, but rebuild your snare track. Actually set up a drum, tune the drum yourself, 
set it up in the studio and set up mics around this drum and how to basically recapture this snare drum. And I've had clients come to me with poorly recorded tracks and they're a little uneasy on the sound of the drums and they kind of leave it open ended of like, you know, see what you can do. So I saw what I could do and, and I, I'd never actually tried really diving into it until a particular client's file. And uh, once I did, I was really pleased with the results. I want to show you some of those sounds that I got for that client. And they were absolutely pleased that they didn't have to come in and retrack the drums just because of a simple snare drum that didn't have enough uh, tonalities to it to make it sound like a higher quality recording. So drums are, I mean, they're, they're so important to the quality of the mixes that you do, and the snare drum is right in the center of it. It occupies the low end, the mid range, and the high end of your drum set. If you don't get the snare right, then your whole drum sound tends to kind of fall apart in a hurry. So next week is basically how to how to fix that. If you don't have something that's absolutely perfect, then, well, actually, if it's absolutely terrible, then you can give it such a boost that you really can save the tracks uh, that you were given. So that'll be next week. Hopefully the five-minute reverb chamber was helpful to you. Have fun with this. I'll see you next week.